as advertised, what I'm going to talk about is a simple solvable model uh, in which the Boltzmann equation breaks down. In fact, it breaks down in quite a spectacular way. Um, and uh, that was the abstract, so let's move on. Uh, but just to tell you how spectacular the breakdown is, it's an infinite breakdown in the sense that in the Boltzmann equation, the single particle density matrix turns out to be constant, whereas in the exact solution, we can calculate it, it turns out to have a non-trivial time dependence. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, uh, remind you, although after the last, last couple of talks, you don't need a lot of reminding about density operators, but the time dependence of them perhaps you do, uh, and reduce density operators and this chain of equations the so-called BBGKY equations uh, that determine the time dependence and how they're connected to one another. And then uh, we can talk about what the Boltzmann equation is in that sense, discuss what the model is, and uh, show you what goes on. Uh, I should remark before I get into that that the way I started to think about this problem was uh, because about 20 years ago, uh, a then student of mine, Mark Thompson, uh, and I were working on kinetic equations for neutrinos in a situation where there was a large background density of neutrinos, as you might get in a supernova or the early universe. Uh, and um, Around about 10 years after that, there were a couple of papers published uh, who were su suggesting that these equations were possibly uh, inconsistent uh, and used, based that argument on some models. And uh, so uh, a couple of the, two of the last three students that I had worked on this uh, problem and uh, we worked our way laboriously through a whole bunch of calculations, uh, which eventually gave the effect that I just mentioned, that uh, the model seemed to be the problem rather than the set of kinetic equations that we had. Um, so let me just remind you that uh, with a quantum system, if we describe it in terms of density operators on Hilbert space, then the expectation value of any operator, you've seen this equation often in the, the last session. Uh, but the time evolution of the system is in this, described by uh, the von Neumann equation. It's a, derived simply from the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and if I have a one particle operator, then of course, I can uh, take the trace over all the other particles first and get a one particle density matrix. So the expectation value of some one particle operator will be the trace uh, over that one particle of the reduced density matrix. The one up here means it's been reduced to a one body density matrix. Uh, and that's the trace over all the other particles. So in the same kind of way, I can write down uh, two-body reduced density matrices, three-body reduced density matrices, and so on. The uh, basic idea, as usual, is just to get rid of all the stuff that's not interesting and concentrate on the stuff which is. Um, now, the, it, you might suggest then that perhaps we could write down an equation for the time evolution of the one-body density matrix. Um, our n-body system is a complicated system, so we wouldn't expect that to be a closed equation. It turns out that it's real, the time dependence of the one-body density matrix is given by the two-body density matrix, and the time dependence of the two-body density matrix given by the three-body density matrix, and so on. You get a whole chain of equations. In the classical system, these equations were originally written down uh, by Bogolyubov, by Born and Green, and by Kirkwood and Yvonne. Uh, and the first reference 
to the quantum equations that I know of uh, is a paper which was written down almost at the same time by Bogolyubov and Gurov. So perhaps we should change what the normal way of referring to this set of equations is the BBGKY equations, uh, but perhaps it should be uh, BG, BGKY to include this paper in the, in the set as well. Um, so these equations are, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just out of habit, I would say BBGKY anyway, so I'm going to keep that habit and keep on saying it. Um, for our n particle system, let's keep it simple and keep on just two body <coughs> interactions. If we had uh, more than two body interactions, this set of equations would become even more complicated. Uh, so that uh, the Hamiltonian of the system in the usual way, single particle Hamiltonian, which could be just a kinetic term, but could contain some single particle potential and some interaction potential of the two. And if we do that uh, and uh, throw away the h-bar, uh, the first of the BBGKY equations for the time dependence of the single particle uh, density matrix is the commutator of that with the one body operator. And then when I have the two body operator, I have, uh, obviously I have to have the two body density matrix, otherwise I'm not going to be able to have any other particle around to hook that one on. Uh, so we get this equation, as I said, the time dependence of the single body uh, density matrix depends on the two body density matrix. And of course we can generalize that and keep on going. Uh, and this is the, uh, if I have, uh, so the time dependence of the n particle density matrix where the little n is somewhat small, smaller than the total number of particles, then uh, depends on the n plus one. We have a commutator of, of an operator with the n particles, and this is the small n particle Hamiltonian, and then we have the interaction of uh, one of these n particles with an extra one, uh, and uh, this factor here just says it doesn't really matter which extra one it is, you just, they're all the same. Uh, so that's a straightforward situation, and you might ask, well, we, have, we, we haven't made any progress, really. We had some complicated problem and we've replaced it by some other complicated problem. Uh, so is there any way of decoupling these equations? And of course, the answer is yes, you can, but you have to make an approximation to do so. And the simplest approximation uh, would be to neglect many particle correlations completely and say that the uh, n-body density matrix is just the product of one-body density matrices for all of them. Uh, and then we do get a simplification. We get uh, that uh, this equation involving the two-body density matrix just involves to one-body density matrices. So it becomes a, a closed equation for a, a single-body density matrix, but it's a, a nonlinear equation because we have the single-body density matrix appearing twice. And this is essentially the Boltzmann equation. We've, we've reduced it to that form. Uh, so there are some simple properties that one can derive from this uh, that the uh, obviously, the single body density matrix is unitary, uh, and if we had, if we have a pure state, uh, then of course rho squared is is rho. Uh, that's true uh, in the in the Boltzmann equation, but not true in general. If if we had start out with a pure state at t equals zero, then in the Boltzmann equation, uh, then that condition is maintained. And that's a relatively straightforward calculation based on the equation that was back here. It's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you the details, but it, it's uh, pretty straightforward from there. Um, so let me now talk about the particular model. As I said, we came into this by thinking about a neutrino system. Uh, and neutrino, the basic interaction 
is that if I have a, cyst have a set of, say, two, three, whatever number of different flavors of neutrinos, and uh, they interact, they'll, uh, one of the things that will happen in the interaction is that either uh, they will just bounce off one another and keep the same flavors, or they will interchange flavors. And uh, of course, other things can happen in the interaction. There'll be some kind of scattering involved. Uh, but the simplest thing to do is to just have that flavor interchange. So this is, well, again, I did it. And for some reason, you have to be more definite going backwards. Um, I, the flavors remain the same or they interchange so that particle two gets the, the flavor that was originally on particle one, the index i. And, uh, you can write that out in terms of various components, and it's just a product of, of uh, direct matrices on the, on the various components that you have. So this is, and uh, you can, if you uh, think in terms of direct matrices, if you had something like this term here, where the components are mixed up, you'd do a Fertz transformation and put the components in the right order, uh, and when you do that, uh, if I have just two flavors, so the op operators are as vectors xi are, are two-dimensional, and the operators are going to be two by twos, uh, uh, it'll just turn out to be, oops, uh, writable in terms of, of Pauli matrices. Of course, if I if I go to the general case where I have F dimensions, uh, I have Gell-Mann matrices uh, in that case. And, uh, come on. In those terms, just the two-dimensional case, that uh, term with the delta of the delta function components in the wrong order just gets transformed into a product of Pauli matrices. In general, it's a product of the uh, <coughs> Gell-Mann matrices. But you can see, of course, that I can rewrite product of sigma i dot sigma j as uh, subtracting a constant. It's just sigma i plus sigma j all squared. And you can then arrange this, because I've summed over all the i's and j's, to be just the total sum of the spins, all squared. And then you adjust the constant, you find that the Hamiltonian for this system uh, is just related to the, to the square of the total spin uh, with some additive constant. Same thing ha actually happens with the, uh, with the general f-dimensional case. It's the square of the total f-spins plus some constant. Uh, but this is an equation that you can actually solve. Right? It only depends on the total spin, uh, and that's some quantity we know for the system. Uh, so we've, we have an equation, Hamiltonian, we can solve. We uh, can write down the exact solutions. As I said, this is a simplification of what goes on in the real system. It's a simplification in many ways. Uh, the, every particle is interacting with every other particle in the system with the same strength. And uh, that's not something that we would think of as being quite usual because at the interactions are independent of position. They're interacting with the same strength whether they're next to one another or whether one's here and one's up there in the back corner of the room. Uh, and uh, the, the interactions are also independent of, of uh, momentum. Uh, so the, the total spin is conserved in the interaction and that's why the model is solvable. So we can write down the eigenvalues and we can work out the eigenstates. The eigenstates depend on the total spin, the projection of the total spin, and another quantum number which has, uh, tells us how out of all these 
n particles, we've constructed this particular total spin. And uh, once you do that, uh, you, can, you can work out anything in the system you wanted to know. You can work out all of those uh, density matrices. Uh, the the uh, total one, the one body one, the two body one, and so on. And uh, we, we did manage to write down the, the uh, closed form for the first three of the uh, reduced density matrices. The, the one body density matrix uh, has angular momentum coupling coefficient six, uh, six J coefficients, the two body nine J, the three body 12 J, and so on. Uh, and just for reasons of nostalgia, I'll put up the, uh, the one for the two-body density matrix. It's reasons of nostalgia because uh, I did my PhD on nuclear structure and shortly after that I did some work on nuclear reactions. And as you would, as you would realize that when you do that, then you get a whole bunch of this uh, angular momentum coupling comes in. Uh, and I thought I'd been able to forget that for 40 years or so, but then I found out that I had to te uh, remind myself of it so I could teach my, my final couple of graduate students all about it. Um, and with uh, things like this, you can calculate what's going on. For example, uh, you can calculate the probability that uh, if we start out with uh, spin up, spin of particle one up at time, uh, at time t equals zero, what's the probability that uh, the spin will be up at some later time t? And uh, we've got a uh, total number of, of spins of uh, this number, 2560, for whatever reason. Uh, and as you change the number of spin up at the beginning, uh, you get fluctuations and you see that you get a, a, a fairly sh short period of, of uh, fluctuations and then nothing much happens and then you get a recurrence, which is what you expect for a finite system. This is a finite system and so it has Loschmidt recurrence after some long time. Uh, and, and you get some kind of oscillations uh, over short periods near the beginning. And you can also compute the correlation function. Uh, and you get the same type of behavior. You have uh, this, uh, uh, we'll look at this one for example, you have uh, oscillations of relatively short period, you have a recurrence over here, uh, and then the same thing goes on. Um, this little glitch there is actually not real. It's just uh, some problem with the way Mathematica draws its graphs. Uh, but uh, I point out that the correlation in this case is reasonably small. It's around 10% or less than 10% most of the time. Uh, so that uh, we're in a situation where the correlations are small and uh, for that reason we might expect that throwing the correlations away and just working with the Boltzmann equation is, is going to be a reasonable way of doing things. And uh, in fact, when my student came back and said the Boltzmann equation is giving us nonsense, uh, I said, must be something wrong. <laughs> so after a lot of agony on everybody's part, we discovered that uh, that was indeed the right answer. Uh, and this is another one of the correlation functions, different choice of, of numbers of spin ups and spin downs to begin with, uh, but you get the same type of behavior, oscillatory behavior uh, on the short term and then long period oscillations as well. Again, the same type of behavior. Uh, so you can work everything out. You've got the n-body density matrices. You can go away and calculate and do the whole thing. Uh, and you find that the Boltzmann equation gives the wrong answer, whereas 
the first of the BBGKY equations does give you the right answer. Uh, so that there's nothing wrong with the, with the BBGKY equations, it's all wrong with the Boltzmann equation. Uh, and just to remember that, the Boltzmann equation tells us that, it turns out, it tells us that the single body density matrix is a constant. And this is what it actually looks like. Uh, so in spite of their small co size, the correlations are driving uh, what's happening. They're completely uh, driving the time dependence of the single body density matrix. And having got that result and agonized over whether all these calculations with all these angular, angular momentum couplings were indeed coming out right, and uh, my memory of the first time I got involved with those was that keeping track of the signs was one, one hell of a problem. And it was too much for most of the people that wrote textbooks as well. Uh, so, um, but it turns out that you can actually give a general proof that the Boltzmann equation will break down. And you can, it's sufficiently nice that you can do it uh, in the uh, case where you have F flavors. Uh, you just have to write out everything in terms of the uh, Gelman matrices and components like this. Uh, and you get some various consistency conditions so that the uh, single, single body operators like the single body Hamiltonian is written out in terms of one of these. Two body operators like the potential or the two particle Hamiltonian is written out, uh, two, two particle density matrix written out in terms of direct products of two of them and so on. Uh, and when you do those manipulations, you find that the Boltzmann equation reduces to an equation like this that we have. Uh, remember, uh, we, we have an equation for the components. Uh, of the single particle density operator, uh, which is given in terms of the structure constants uh, of uh, the SUN group, SUF group, I should say. And uh, it looks just like a new single particle Hamiltonian, uh, which is generated by the uh, by the, by the single particle density matrix. So as I said, you have a closed equation. You've only got p's in this equation, uh, but it's a nonlinear equation. Now, in our detailed calculations, we started with states that were either spin up or spin down. Uh, so that meant that in general, uh, in, in, the th in the three component case, only p3 was uh, non-zero. Uh, and the generalization to that where you have uh, F flavors is that you only have the diagonal Gelman matrices coming in. Uh, and the, because the diagonal Gelman matrices are diagonal, they, they commute with the others. So that the Fs where we have one of the diagonal ones, one of these indices is the M for the diagonal, they're zero. So that tells you that p dot is zero. So that's the general result without any of the agony. Uh, and that uh, shows that if uh, uh, p dot is going to be constant, p is going to be constant. And as you saw from the graphs, the single particle probabilities are definitely not constant. So the single particle density matrix is definitely not constant. We're infinitely wrong in going to the Boltzmann equation. Uh, so in fact, you don't even need to do the other calculation that I just did. Each time I write this down, I find a simpler way of proving the result. <laughs> so all you need to do is to notice that, um, that if, I cho if it happens that at t equals zero, row one is diagonal, then this is going to be, this will commute with that. And, 
I put the trace with particle two in there, and I get a commutator of row one with the other stuff, and row one is diagonal, so it commutes with anything. Uh, so this term is also zero. So uh, almost trivially, uh, row one is a constant. And it looked as if I needed to choose, uh, I mentioned we started out with all our particles with either spin up or spin down, so I needed to choose a particular initial case. Uh, but it, it turns out that, well, even that's not necessary. I can go to whatever basis I like and then because I just have a t equals zero, some given row one, and just choose a basis so that row one is, is diagonal and then it commutes with everything. So uh, if it's diagonal at time t equals zero, uh, it, at whatever state I take, then this is a constant. So the preparation of the states is not so special after all. So what's going wrong? Why is this falling over? Uh, in the general de derivation of the Boltzmann equation, uh, there are various assumptions that are made, but the two key assumptions uh, are the, the one which we have here built, built in, that there are no, no two or more body correlations. Um, and the, the other assumption is that the time between collisions uh, is much longer than the time of a collision. Well, remember this particular model, the interactions are such that particles are interacting wherever they are. So the particle here is interacting with one over there in the top corner. Uh, so that means the time of a collision is uh, the time that the collision takes is arbitrarily long. It's always interacting. So that's the assumption in the derivation of the Boltzmann equation in the usual way that's false. So that we uh, shouldn't be surprised that we're getting out uh, non-Boltzmann behaviour in this particular model. It's, it's not a particularly realistic model. However, it does raise the question uh, that when you're doing these calculations, if you do have a way of going beyond Boltzmann equation, it may not be a bad idea to check that things are okay. Um, so, as I said, I got into this uh, because about 20 years ago, Mark Thompson and I were working on uh, neutrino kinetic equations for a situation where you had uh, neutrinos interacting with a, with a large background of neutrinos. So it was, um, and uh, other people around about the same time produced similar equations. Um, in fact, I, as a side remark, I should remark that uh, Mark and I also did the, the um, arbitrary number of flavors case. Uh, which is something which uh, has only recently just become fashionable to do with three by three neutrino oscillations. Uh, and models were developed which tried to show whether the correlations are important uh, and in perhaps even important enough to make the neutrino kinetic equations invalid. And the models happened to be inclusive, which, inconclusive, which is why we got into to wondering about what we could do, uh, and we found this exact solution uh, of one of the models, in fact. And so it turns out that correlations are small, but correlations are important. Uh, when I was putting this talk together, uh, for some reason in, in one search I did on the internet, I came across uh, another application of almost the same model. Uh, and this is a paper by Patskoukas and Kastner uh, in the Journal of Statistical Mechanics of last year, uh, where they talk about a long range quantum spin system uh, and discuss equilibration in that system. So they take a Hamiltonian for n particles, which is, as I had it before, a uh, single 
sum of single particle Hamiltonians, the sum of two particle interactions. And uh, when they have the two particle interactions, they have an interaction potential which doesn't depend on uh, which particles you took were interacting. So it's exactly the same type of model. It's a generalization of it because uh, they put in this single particle potential, but they have a situation where the, the uh, uh, interaction doesn't depend on where on the lattice the particles are. And what they studied was a, was a different aspect of this. Uh, they did some numerical solutions for the BBGKY equations uh, for a particular choice of the parameters uh, and uh, decide that the, uh, of course, this square of F1, uh, this mod of F1, which is the square of the probability of particle one, should be bounded by one. They start out doing calculations uh, by generalizing what I did before, uh, putting in the correlation matrices so that they say the two-body density matrix is the product of one-body density matrix matrices plus a two-body correlation matrix, the three-body density operator product, product of all three one-bodies, and then one body with the two-body correlation function, and then the three-body correlation function, and so on. You can generalize that, keep going. Uh, and they do the calculations, and they find a different uh, type of breakdown. But uh, if we did just in, in uh, they call it nth order, uh, putting the correlation function equal to zero for uh, n plus one, so that the they find that this function, which is supposed to be less than one, uh, is on the simplest approximations disastrously worse, going up way up there. And only when you get to very high orders does it be, begin to come down. Uh, so the, for them, they find that the BGKY hierarchy breaks down in a different kind of a way. Uh, and it's an interesting question, but since I only started to found out about their paper just before I came here, uh, our model is, is a special case of theirs. The single particle interactions are zero, and the uh, other interactions are constant. Um, and, but it's an interesting question to look at the higher order BBGKY equations and, and see what happens in, in this particular case. Uh, they also produce a different way of uh, simplifying the equations, which uh, gives you some advantages. Uh, and for them, gives a, a situation where it doesn't break down so easily. Uh, but to, to, whoops, wrong one. Uh, uh, what happens in, in higher order BBGKY equations in this model is an open question. I haven't had time to worry about it yet. Uh, so this is a follow-up work to those students. I also worked with Alex Friedland, who was generated one of the models uh, that we tried to, to solve exactly. And for anyone who wants references, uh, they, they, they are. Um, and finish up by thanking the organizers for asking me to give a talk here, uh, thanking you for listening, and thanking Freeman for his inspiration and uh, congratulations on his 90th year. Okay.